Yeah, that's weird. People were coming in, but yeah, it's interesting. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hooray. Yay. It's good to see everyone again. I'm excited to see folks coming back. Yeah. Hooray. Yeah, we're just as like normal. <clears throat> we'll be waiting about five minutes for folks to come in and then we'll get started. Uh, yeah. That's really cool to know from a technical standpoint that at, at eight, it lets everybody in or if when we go live, it lets everybody in. Yeah. It's, Dave funny. was refilling his coffee and he didn't get back and I don't have access to a button. <laughs> That's an interesting note. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming back, everybody. We're excited to see you all. This has been really cool seeing everybody's uh, some of people's roles from last week, some of the adventures they're planning to write. <laughs> uh, this week's going to be a little technical. So we've recommended that you review Chapter 3 of the DMG. I would recommend you have access to it so that you can look at the section on creating encounters. We're going to be recovering that section today, and it is one of the more technical aspects of the adventure writing process. So we will be doing a lot of arithmetic tonight, and It'll help you if you can review the relevant sections on your end as well. Yeah, we're pretty much just going to be looking at <clears throat> four pages worth of content that starts on page 81. So if, you, if you're getting in here, you've got your DMG with you. 81 is going to be your jam. <clears throat> Don't worry. We'll go. We'll be gentle. <laughs> this is... Uh, it's once once you get the hang of it, this is like it gets to be pretty easy. I'm doing this in my this sleep. is probably the toughest thing we have to teach you all, I think, though, because yeah, a lot of people think like you just wing it with D and D, and you wing it in the moment when you're having to deal with the the choices the players make. But you can prepare the appropriate difficulty levels of your adventure before the players get there as your baseline. Yeah. Yeah, when it comes to adventure design too, and if this is something that you are interested in doing <clears throat> professionally, the old adage, the rules or guidelines, or however you want to phrase it, kind of doesn't work because if you write an adventure that is not, it's like either too weak, it'll be boring. If it's too powerful, people will be like, oh, this is a meat grinder. Some pe some people like that though, <laughs> but um, yeah, this is this is kind of where we get into the nitty gritty, and it's like um, I compare it to like learning how to cook, right? Um, when just starting out, <clears throat> you go by the recipes, and what we're going to show to you is is the main recipe for making adventures, and then after a while, it becomes second nature to you, and you don't have to constantly open up your cookbook to do see how to cook a recipe. But uh, yeah, anyways, we'll we'll get started in about three minutes. Get your coffee ready. Get your water. <laughs> get your get your groove on. Oh man, now you gotta get your roll on stuck in my head. It's 2021, and that's hey, stuck in my head. Yes. Be careful, Sarge. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> it's gonna get you. <laughs> For those of you who saw a conversation <laughs> about the new, um, which is the Coast product. Yeah, we got some, some guy got mad because we said Watsy. I know, I that? saw that. I'm like, calm down there, Chief. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to. Yeah, Wizards of the Coast, Incorporated, Seattle, Washington. <laughs> we make, gotta Trademark. make sure we, we use their name, their complete name. Copyright. Do we do other people just call them Founded. wizards for short? I don't know. I don't know. We, you guys got to remember, Dave and I do not sit in voice chats with each other a lot. We're mostly just in text channels, so we just type Watsy for short. Yeah, that was really, <laughs> it was really funny. Um, and I, I don't know if the person's in here, but I'm just gonna share with you because it's really funny. Because like, it was like, uh, it was so like upset, like. Whoa, whoa, trigger warning. Calm down. <laughs> it's because we were saying Watsy instead of Wizards of the Coast or Wizards or whatever. And um, 
I thought about it because we had done the the European night, and they thought we were saying a weird term we didn't know because there are a couple of people who English is their second language. Like, yeah, what? maybe that was it. That was it. That was it. I mean, you guys like what Z? What's that? Is that a creature? <laughs> yes. A uh, I mean, lesson learned. You know, it's a it's a progress process. And if I have to say Wizards of the Coast every time, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it like in a low tone, like a like I'm an Amazon Echo oh, or something no. every time. Oh, let's see. If you cannot see or hear us, please reconnect. Yeah, everybody else can see and hear us, right? Uh, yeah, quick check in. Please acknowledge if you can see us currently, can, folks. Can you see us? Can you see us? <sighs> I don't know. Can they not? Okay. Yeah, people Thank say you. yeah. Thank you, friends. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 too many. Too many. Ah! 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 We're buried under yeses. I got some everywhere. That's gray hair, buddy. That's, yeah. that's 30 years of D&D &D right there. Boop. That's 30 <laughs> years of people saying, that's a 27 hit. Yes. Shut up, Joe. <laughs> 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 all right take 10 it's everybody right. ready can you come back it? everyone we're excited for can it can you feel it <sighs> okay cool i'm excited watsy wizards of the coast it's the game it's the creator of the game that we play not watsy all right, how to write adventures for tabletop RPGs too. If you are all just joining us now, the um, Sarge kind of mentioned that this will be the more technical aspect of um, how to write a tabletop RPG. Um, there will be a little bit of arithmetic in here. Do not be afraid. It's very simple um, stuff. And we're also going to give you um a spreadsheet that'll help you do all that you know we might just make a copy of ducky's spreadsheet sorry no, i'm thinking about it not that one. Oh, is it a mess no it's too powerful that's a development tool okay uh, all right. but we know you all are going to have a lot of questions yep. uh dave will pause for questions i will be in the chat uh, i'm gonna turn off my camera yes. while dave is presenting and I'll answer simple questions in chat, but mostly hold them until we take the breaks because we got a lot to explain. Yeah, this and we're, we're here to make sure everybody gets it. So we're, you know, we're definitely cognizant that this is one of the harder sections. Um, but after this, it's all pretty simple. Uh, and then again, like I said, once you get used to it, it's really simple. Uh, and it's all outlined in the DMG. It's just arguably it's not very well organized in the DMG. So here we go. Um, all right. So. We are going to be talking about creating encounters today. Uh, obviously, you know, last week we talked about um, putting together the actual adventure, the you know, the beginning, the ending, and then everything. And we talked about the middle. This is really where we're going to start fleshing out the middle, where we talk about um, encounters mostly. So as we start off thinking about the encounters that we want to create, <clears throat> and in this term, it's we're mostly going to be talking about encounters that. Uh, are with other creatures in the game, not so much like traps and stuff like that, but um, uh, or social encounters. But well, I mean, these could be social encounters, but like traps and hazards and stuff like that. We're not really talking about. We're talking about like the the heart and soul of D and D, which is encountering monsters in you know dark places. <laughs> so each encounter should have an objective. Now, Bop the monster is probably the most common objective. In other words, you know, you just go in and you fight. But you could have other reasons for entering handling an encounter, and that's vastly going to change the dynamic of the encounter itself <clears throat> if you have an objective that isn't purely just hit the monster in the head. Um, some examples include you can make peace with them. Uh, you can be there to protect an NPC or object. Uh, you can retrieve an object, run a gauntlet, uh, sneak in or sneak past them, stop a ritual, take out a single target, pretty much anything that you can think of. Um, so it's not always just going to be about um, fighting the monster, though I'd say that's probably obviously going to be the most common type encounter that you run to. All right. 
So um, we're also going to mention a little bit about the SRD. Um, this is really it's this is going to be the most most important for people who plan on doing this professionally and having it published um, anywhere outside of really uh, DMs Guild. Um, if you're going to have like your own Patreon with this kind of content, uh, do a Kickstarter with a book, put it on Amazon, even put it on Drive Through RBG, which is not really associated. It's kind of associated with Wizards of the Coast, Wizards of the Coast, not Watsi. <laughs> but it's uh, um, this is the sort of the guidelines that Wizards of the Coast gives us in order to create content as a third party content creator. OK, so they give you um, basically what is a contract called the open gaming license. It's an open source document that grants third party creators like myself and like some of you um, license to create their own fifth edition content so long as that contents follows the rules outlined in the srd and what that means in the srd is the outlines the actual content within the three fifth edition core rule books that the content creators are allowed to reference and put into their own work okay so for example um i would say about 75 percent of the player's handbook is accessible. Uh, they exclude a few chapters from there. Um, you really don't get access to a lot of the feats and backgrounds. But for example, like all the spells are there. Um, all the classes are there, but not all the subclasses. All the races are there, but not all the sub races. Um, uh, you get like one feat and one background. <laughs> and then uh, um, all the core rules itself. Interestingly, none of the character creation rules. So that's worth pointing out. Uh, the DMG, it's much more truncated in what you get to use. Um, and don't don't worry about writing all this down. I'm going to give you guys, there's in that document I gave you last week, there's links where you can see all this stuff and reference it as needed. But I'm just kind of giving you like a broad overview. The DMG really only includes, uh, I think the, gosh, it's very limited, like the objects table, poison, madness, and maybe one or two other things. You don't really get much of the DMG in the SRD, so you really can't reference a lot of that. Some stuff rather obnoxiously slow, such as the hazards lists um, from, I think, Chapter 5. Uh, and then the monster manual, I'd say you get about 80 to 75% of their monsters. Um, you're not going to get some of the most famous ones, which is kind of a bummer. Like, you can't really use uh, beholders. You can't use mind flares, uh, troglodytes, uh, some weird ones like Banshee and Cyclopes, Cyclopes um, aren't in the SRD. So it's it's good to know these things. Um, you don't have to memorize them all. I mean, at this point, we have them memorized because we do this every day. But there are resources on the Internet, including the official documents themselves, which you can get on dnd.wizards.com, as well as websites that help break it all down and make it easy for you to search. OK, so like I said, if you're going to do this just by yourself, you can write whatever you want. You can use all the books, but if you're going to use Watsi's content, you have to stay what's within the um, systems reference document. OK. Uh, all right. So now that the the legal stuff is out of the way, um, the uh, now we're going to get into or should we take a couple questions on that, Sarge? Because SRD could be kind of a new concept. I, think so. I, I don't, don't want to. Yeah, true. I don't want to scare anybody not... away with uh, <laughs> Talk of the SRD. Uh, the open gaming license is designed for third party creators to build stuff if they're yes. trying to sell it to people. If you're just making content for your friends or you're just having fun with it, you can do whatever you want. But if you intend to sell anything, you have to obey the guidelines of the open gaming license, which refers to its systems reference document. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish I had a copy laying around. Uh, Jeremiah Brutal... asked us if their content contains characters, monsters, feats, etc. that they've created specifically for that adventure. Uh, you're allowed to do that. You can create your yeah. own stuff. That's 100% allowed. Yeah, you can create your own stuff. It, you don't have to. You're not limited. It's not a limited palette. It's just saying like, hey, all this other stuff is ours. You can't use it. Um, there's a lot of proper nouns and stuff. Like technically, you can't use the word underdark for example. <laughs> so you have to, you'll see a lot of people be kind of, uh, for example, this is a book by Cobalt Press I recently bought, which is their Kingdom of the Ghouls. And they don't call the Underdark Underdark. They call it like something else. 
it's basically the underdark you know it's it, it's the idea of what the underdark is but they have to abide by the rules set forth in the ogl which as you'll see this is the open gaming license all this text right here you have to put in every single one of your printed products if you do fifth edition stuff we'll go over a lot of that when we do the writing but this is like a perfect example of a third party a major third party brand mind you cobalt press um using the ogl and the standard reference document and then all of our broadsword issues also come with that too henry asks, uh, does referencing include just mentioning for example could you simply say see page 47 in the monster manual um, I would leave out pages, and you can't say Monster Manual. <laughs> you have to say MM. Uh, Monster Manual is, is part of their IP, and you can't say Player's Handbook. You can't say Dungeons and Dragons. You can't say D&D. You can't say DM. You can't say Dungeon Master's Guide. You can't say Monster Manual. So that's why a lot of times you'll see third-party creators like us call it fifth edition of the world's greatest role-playing game, you know? <laughs> or if you you're have, ready for Pathfinder, they call D&D the oldest role-playing game. The oldest role-playing game. Pathfinder 2 is third-party content published under the SRD. They have uh, an OGL at the back of all their books. So if you go all the way to the back, you'll see it. This, this is, is from the third edition of the game. Mm -hmm. Yep, they use the um, SRD 3 point whatever um, for theirs. We use 5.1. Um, I know, and... I know to sort of... Uh, finish answering Henry's question. Older editions of the game tended to refer to the specific page you'd find things. Fifth edition rarely does that for two major reasons. Uh, one, uh, the game is partially digital now, so page numbers are useless. Second, WotC reprints their books and they update Wizards them. of the so, Coast. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Wizards of the Coast, <laughs> when they release Errata, eventually when the book goes back into a new printing run, for distribution, they will fix issues or modify change, modify the book accordingly. So mm. sometimes the page numbers change if they adapt their own content. So yeah. Wizards often doesn't refer to any specific page numbers in a book unless the book is referring to itself internally. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. When you're when you're referencing though, um, it's best just to be kind of. I try to get away from using the official terms as much as I can. From what I understand, you can use the initials like DMG, PHB, and MM, but I don't think technically you can reference the pages. It's it's like anything when you deal with kind of like a legal thing like that, even though it's pretty flexible and frankly, you know, they're not going to be hovering over you. Um, it's just easier to like play on the, on the, the safe side than it is to like try to like, oh, it's an eyeball monster that can float. You know, if you say something like that, they're going to be like, come on now. We know what you're talking about. <laughs> but, you know, like uh, uh, some things, there's some gray areas. It really just, my we recommendation can't is. answer extensive questions about the OGL yeah. because we are not legal experts. If you are Correct. looking, I have, sincerely, folks, if you have questions about the open gaming license, you should read the document and look online to see what other legal aspect uh, legal people out there have talked about it and refer to your own uh, legal advice regarding yeah. publishing your own content if you're unsure. We yeah, not, it's... we can't give you extensive guidance on that, but that is what that is yeah. the document that guides what is and isn't legal to distribute yeah. commercially for Dungeons and Dragons. If you want to use the entirety of the content commercially, you can place it on DM's Guild and then deal with wizard's yep. own rules regarding that yep and if you go to Wizard's site they'll tell you exactly what works and what doesn't work in terms of um their stuff but if yeah if you want to use beholders and mind flayers in the whole shebang then yeah you could publish on dm's guild that is totally an option available to you um you'd be able to make ravenloft content everon content uh stuff set in forgotten realms etc uh we we exist outside of it so we live and die by the srd but as far as like um it's pretty flexible and it's pretty easy to use. And it's been around for over 20 years now, uh, starting with third edition being the first, they, you know, they invented this. And now a lot of other companies, including uh, Chaosium uses it for basic role play. Fate has one. Um, D20 Modern has its own SRD so uh, and OGL. So there's, it's, it's if, a lot of fun and it's really cool. Uh, if, yeah, you're regardless pro, if you're of... from a programming background, it's very similar to like, like open source content from programmers that uh, they give you, you know, that you can do whatever with. Yes. If this, we're primarily going to talk about Wizards of the Coast rules regarding 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons because that's where we live commercially. But 
this is basically the same in any sort of system. Each, if you're trying to develop content commercially for any sort of game system, you need to refer to the creators of that system's rules regarding how you can go about doing that. Everybody mm -hmm. has their own rules for how they handle their own stuff. Yeah. And you don't want to invest too much of your time and then receive a very, very stern letter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I mean, granted, you know, the, the Eye of Sauron's not like, you're not reading every piece of content on the internet. But like I said, if you play it on the safe side, you'll never have a problem. Um, and we, we know by heart at this point, all the magic items we can't use, all the spells that aren't available, you know, it's, 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 always, you fun. it's always fun when we're proofing. We'll do something like earlier, yeah. th earlier this week, we were going through a document and we saw a cap of water breathing. We're like, I don't think that's SRD. Mm -hmm. And then we had to change it. Yeah. Uh, um, and there's some things that actually like change in the SRD, like proper nouns, like it's not more than kind it's private sanctum. It's just private sanctum. It's not nice tools, magic, or it's arcanists, man. You know, it's little things like that. You just get used to it and it's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty easy. So I wouldn't like, don't stress because it's like the legal side of things. And it's basically like Wizards of the Coast is like, hey, we are totally down with you creating this stuff because we get to have a cut if you post it on TM Skills. <laughs> and all we have to do is put out four books a year instead of like uh, the 24 sure. that we did in third third edition. So, um, yeah, it, it benefits them and it benefits you. It's a pretty cool. It, it is one of the best inventions ever to come out for role playing games, honestly. And they, they love it. We love it. So, all right, uh, we don't want to yeah. get too lost. Yeah, in we'll, that. yeah, let's we'll get this, back this, into the nitty gritty. Can, yeah, all right, so let's get so I just wanted to make sure you're cognizant of that when you are picking the encounters that you want to do because you don't want to like get all the way, you know, you write a whole mind flare layer and then you're like, oh, I can't use mind flares, Blah. you know. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll answer that question before we continue. Uh, Lance has sure. to pay a licensing fee. Uh, no, Wizards of the Coast does not charge a licensing fee, you don't even have to contact that. Them. You don't, as long as you follow the rules, it's fine. Yep. Um, no, no direct contact or anything. They just like, here's our stuff. You can use it. Please don't, you know, screw the pooch. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about, hang on one second. Ugh, sorry, dog. Um, let's talk about balancing encounters okay here's a broad overview of the system and the way it works all right so when you're looking to balance encounters for an adventure that you're writing or session you have to do the following first um you must determine the party's adventuring day xp this is basically going to be your budget for purchasing encounters hold on one second hey sarge can you take over real quick yep when you're dealing with uh, balancing the encounters, the very first thing you need to understand is that the game is based around how, many, how much difficulty the party faces over the course of a day. This is why each creature has a CR value with an XP amount related to it. And when you're balancing your encounters for the day, you're going to start by first determining how many people are in the party and what their various levels are. There is a chart that yeah, they we'll, will show in the next couple of slides. Yeah. This, <laughs> then is, you... this will be... Sorry. No, <laughs> yeah, go this ahead. Be just, I'm, just ba ba I'm just going to give the end overview. But yeah, like like Sarge was saying, you, create, you first come up with your budget, then you determined the cost for each of your encounters with the adjusted experience point total. Then you determine the relative difficulty for each encounter, mostly determine um, whether or not... You, you mean, you don't want to kill them or so. Then you construct encounters that use all or most of the party's adventuring day XP total. Now, an adventuring day is defined as um, an, ad an adventuring day is going to be the time between two long rests. OK, so from the moment that they wake up from their previous long rests, have all of their resources available to them again, including hit points, spells, uh, single shot features, things like that until they have to take another long rest. That is your adventuring day. And basically all we do is we come up with what does that look like in points in terms of the value of their resources? What is the cost of each thing that they're gonna face that'll drain those points? And then relative to, uh, what is the relative difficulty of each of those encounters? Okay, so that's the basics. We're gonna go down into the more nitty gritty stuff now. All right. 
So first we want to determine the adventuring day XP. So building a day's worth of encounters is similar to putting together a war games army using a point system. So if you've ever played Warhammer or something like that, or anything where you've got X number of points, which you can use to um, build like your army, or in this case, a series of encounters, um, it's, it's very similar. The total number of points that you have to purchase the encounters is the adventuring day XP relative to the character's levels. This is gonna be on page 84 of the DMG. I've included this table right here. This is gonna be your adventures budget, okay? So when looking at this, it's important to note that this is per character, okay? In other words, if we wanted to make a first level adventure for four people, we'd look at first, and then we look at 300 adjusted XP per day. And if it's for four people, you multiply this number by four, one for, you know, for each player or each character. And your total budget for this day of first level experience is going to be 1,200. Yes, I know that's horribly written, Sarge. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. So... whiteboard go away all right so in order to determine adventuring day xp again you're going to use the adventuring day xp table to find the adjusted xp per day per character for the average level which you intend to write your adventures you multiply that adjusted xp per day per character value by four for example if if you were um, writing for a party of four uh, if you if it was for a party of five you'd multiply by five three by three etc right um this is going to be your total number of points that you have to purchase. So kind of just repeating what I said again. Um, if you were going to be publishing, typically what you want to do is write it thinking about every character is this, going to be the same level. So a third level adventure assumes that everybody's third level. And we usually write for four characters. Um, that seems to be the average number of characters. It's kind of the classic number. So anytime, regardless of which level, you're writing for you're going to be you know if you're writing for a first level adventure you do four characters times 300 if you're writing for sixth level you know you do four characters times four thousand to get sixteen thousand um adjusted xp okay let's see what's the side of this okay all right i'm sure there's going to be some questions about that <laughs> so sarge if you're still you're still there, Sarge. Sarge. I'm here. I'm did, did the, sta the, did the stapler get you, Sarge? Questions. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm having a nightmare about a stapler hitting me one of these days. You keep messing with mm -hmm. me like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, go ahead. And if you guys have any questions about the Adventuring Day XP uh, calculations while we're here, by all means, we'll give you guys about a minute. Uh, does writing for four work out to the levels three to five, like on our adventures? Oh, so when we when we say when we say like average APL average party level of four, what we're saying is normal. When we establish our encounters, we have assumed when we did the math that there were four characters at third level. So yeah, on the chart that Dave showed, that would be a total adventuring day XP budget of forty eight hundred for the number of creatures the number of characters that we're concerned about yeah you just multiply that number and that's the amount of points so to speak that you'd have to spend it'd be 4800 um points in order to buy your encounters with which we'll show you how to get the raw cost for that in just a second but yeah and that's uh, that's Jeremiah's... pretty much how you come up with your your budget jeremiah is asking if we have thoughts on including notes for smaller or larger parties um, there are details on that. And if you are running for, so let's say you're not looking to publish. And like we said, we usually do four all at the same level, but let's say you're just running your own games and you have, uh, we'll say one person who's third level. Okay. And you got two people who are fifth level. And then you got like, uh, tiny Tim has decided that he wants to play. <laughs> and you got that. So what you do is you would add together all these values. So 300 plus 1200 
plus 7,000 because you multiply this number times two and then that becomes your adventuring day XP budget. When you are, are looking to publish though, um, you can factor that in for sure, uh, all through third edition Dungeon Magazine. And I think most of the modules gave rules for adjusting it up and down. It's just make it's just making sure that you calculate it. For example, like in a lot of the preambles of the adventure that I write, I'll say like uh, this adventure is for three to five. Uh, three to five is usually a good range, and you'll understand why a little bit later in here because it makes the math a little bit easier. But three to five characters of uh, fifth to seventh level and is optimized for four players or four characters of with an average party level of six. Um, you can have a little bit of a range like that, but I would say like a good rule of thumb is just try to shoot for the four in the beginning until you really get a handle of like keeping it all balanced because there's lots of little like things that'll trip you up. Like for example, uh, you can see like right here in the math, like where it breaks down between tiers. It's 1700 for fourth level character, but it jumps more than double for um, fifth level characters. And that's because a fifth level character is twice as powerful as a fourth level character um, because they have so much more damage output that they can do. So <laughs> the too long didn't read is we're, we're going to be writing a first level adventure. I recommend sticking like around level three is pretty clean. Um, the first tier, you know, is going to be easier. But then when you start getting into the other tiers, the math gets kind of wonky and weird. Um, and as, and there's as far a... as, yeah, sorry. There's a couple of complex questions in here. Uh, I'm going to go through some of these really quickly because I don't want to get too lost in all the questions. Uh, the math of the Adventuring Day XP does not account for social scenes that are not designed to tax the party. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then if you're trying to make your encounters variable, the Wizards of the Coast has started in some of their adventures accounting for X number of creatures per player variable depending on sidekicks we've unpacked the math on that and we understand how they're going about doing that so we're capable of replicating that but we don't typically do that because most people just have huge parties anyway mm -hmm. and it's just it ends up becoming a lot of text sometimes that isn't always applicable but it is isn't something terrible to include in your work but yeah. it requires a very robust understanding of the encounter math balance mm-hmm yeah yeah there's there's lots of little odds and ends and frankly I, I believe some of this stuff is pretty updated but for in terms of what we're using we're going to stick with the dmg and the system that they've given us um because more or less like nine times out of ten it's going to get you exactly what you need and you'll find that within the first and second tiers it it here it's it's pretty damn close to um being what it needs to be in the higher tiers this whole second column here it all starts to kind of fall apart at that range um, in terms of like how hard certain things are supposed to be and how hard they're, you know, they're not, but that's a discussion for another day. Right now we really like our focus is going to be within um, this first, the first tier and making sure that we understand kind of that, because that's really like the core of it. Plus it's the, mo the most popular adventures that you'll write will be first tier stuff, generally speaking. But yeah, Chad we'll, we'll fix. Oh, go ahead. Chad, we will answer your question about using this for milestone systems uh, towards the end after we've unpacked all of the math. Yeah, yeah. We'll show you a little bit more on how it, it relates roughly to milestones. It's pretty clever how it works, but we'll show all you that too. All right, so now that we've got the Adventuring Day XP kind of pieced out, remember that's your total budget that you get to spend. You know, That's the $20 bill your mom hands you to go buy lemons and <laughs> sugar and stuff so you can have a lemonade stand. Next, you want to figure out your combat encounter difficulty. So in fifth edition, there are four levels of combat encounter difficulty. Easy, medium, hard, and deadly. An easy encounter doesn't really tax the character's resources or put them in serious peril. However, even though it's easy, um, there's a big difference between easy and like negligible. Like a 20th level character fighting one goblin is, you know, it's a blip on the radar, but a easy encounter for a first level character, you know, could tax some of their resources. And then we'll explain why on the next slide. Medium encounter is more or less um, the measure of, of the party's average level. 
Um, may have one or two scary moments, but are otherwise relatively simple. Medium is usually the easiest one to understand because the CRs that each monster has directly relates to what is considered a medium combat encounter difficulty. So in other words, a fifth level party that fights one CR5 monster, so five char- or four characters at fifth level that fights one monster of CR5, that's a medium encounter. And it's like that all the way down. Okay, so the the game is built so that a rested party can face six to eight medium encounters each day or so one solo creature with a CR equal to their level. (laughs) So you can like now there's some things that are a little bit different that first level characters are much weaker than that. They could not fight six bugbears back to back. They would die. But, you know, um, this is more or less how the game is constructed. Hard encounter starts getting above that. Uh, it could go badly for the adventurers if they make some wrong choices. And then deadly is a deadly encounter could be lethal for one or more characters. It is worth noting that combat encounter difficulty relates directly to the percentage of daily uh, adventuring day XP that gets used and is not an arbitrary value. Here's what I mean by that. So as a rule of thumb, the difficulty for each encounter uses the following percentage of the adventuring day XP value. An easy counter works out to using roughly 5 to 10% of that adventuring day XP budget. Medium encounters use 10 to 20%. Hard encounters use 20 to 30 And deadly encounters use 30 to 40%. Now, what's really important to understand is that encounter difficulty is always relative to how fresh the party is during the fight. However, it's still going to use your resources. So a party that's coming off of a long rest that fights a deadly encounter might feel that the fight is easy, but they're still burning 30 to 40 percent of their daily resources. They've used up some of their hit points already. They've used up some, probably some more of their powerful spells, some of their one-use traits, things like that. They feel good and they don't feel like it was deadly, but what they don't realize is they've burned through 30% of the gas in their tank for that day. Same thing, if that party was to fight that exact same encounter near the end of their adventuring day, after they've already fought like a couple other deadly encounters or some medium encounters, they're going to feel like it's super hard. It's the exact same fight. Nothing has changed. It's just that they're getting to the end of their rope. So this is why a lot of times you'll see that people will create what they thought was a deadly encounter in 5th edition, and they throw it at a rested party, and the party kills it, and they're like, oh, well, that was easy. Well, yeah, it's easy because you're fully rested. But if they had fought that same encounter, like after fighting two other things, it's going to be much harder. So this is really important to understand. I think the word deadly was the wrong word to use when uh, painting these encounters. And it's a big criticism I have of the book. But um, that's more or less how it works. Basically, you can fight roughly three deadly encounters per day before you need a long rest. The um, here's how the numbers actually relate. So combat encounter difficulty values. Each combat encounter difficulty has an XP value that is relative to the character level. You can find the full list of XP values on the XP thresholds by character level table on page 82 of the DMG. It is this gorgeous little guy right here. So let's see how this works. All right. Um, Yeah, so this is the encounter XP per table. Like if you were to have a, let's just say a bugbear go against a first level party. A bugbear is a CR1 monster. It's fighting four uh, characters. You divide, it's 200 XP divided by four, and it's going to get 50, right? And where does that put us? That is a medium encounter for them because that's the adjusted XP that they're going to go against. Same thing if they fought a goblin which is 50 XP times four ends up with 12.5. And then that is going to be roughly pretty, pretty easy, but much different encounter. Finally, like if a hard encounter is going to be something like, let's say an ogre. All right. So an ogre is going to be a CR2 monster. They're worth 450, 450 experience divided by four. That's 112.5. 
they are going to be one ogre fighting a first level party is deadly. Sorry for my terrible handwriting. <laughs> and we'll kind of show you a little bit more how to calculate that because there's a few more details. Uh, let's see. All right. Uh, let's take questions on that real quick. Not too long, maybe about um, five minutes or so. Yeah, sure. Let's. I don't, I'm gonna, we we had a lot of questions in the Monday group, so we're trying to make sure we pause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we understand that this is one of the more complex parts of fifth edition, so we want to make sure uh, it's it's really like you got it. <laughs> we will be going over the entire section, so we will be talking about dealing with lots of creatures or very few creatures relative to the party size. But at this time, does anybody have questions specifically on the encounter difficulties themselves and the ranges of those? Let's see. Maybe Mark asked this question. Oh, those numbers are elvish. <laughs> yeah. Dave's the attempt best. at dwarvish. Remember, elvish is art nouveau, dwarvish is art deco. Okay. How do you account for action economy? Uh, how many easy creatures versus the hard one? So, um, go ahead. Dave. Yeah, that'll get in. We'll we'll probably get in then a couple slides, but that comes with multipliers, which you um, the game has a, a thing that balances it. This is really just describing the broad, general thing with encounter difficulty. But when you start adding more monsters into the mix and the um, the you start getting a variance in action economy. Um, that's when you start putting in multipliers. But we'll go over that in a minute. Yeah, so Hunter, we will talk about how you handle lots of different creatures being involved. But something I want to clear up is there, the term action economy is a fan-developed term over the course of play. Uh, nowhere in any official materials will you hear the term action economy described. Uh, that is a strategic term that we use to describe the tactical difficulty of games. Keith Amon talks about it in his book, for for the DM book and the player book. It is an important mm -hmm. concept, but it isn't really something that 5th edition officially is going to talk about. So just I don't want people to get twisted and be worried about looking for it in the DM. Yeah, book. yeah. There's there's a lot of like philosophical and game design terms that people will will throw around kind of in this thing. But um, this all this sort of arithmetic that we're showing ultimately um, assumes, especially if you're writing from now, if you're writing it on your own table, you can make adjustment, adjustments according to the um, to the combination of like characters and subclasses and magic items and stuff they have. But when you're doing professional publishing, typically you assume that everybody, like everybody who's going to play the module is going to be roughly four people with an average party level of the same and uh, have a, a, a good mix of different you know, archetypes like there's a tank, there's a, uh, you know, DPS spellcaster, there's a rogue who's got skills, there's a healer, you know. Um, yeah, adding in what ifs, um, you can do some of that. Like, you know, if, if you've got like a um, adventure that's going to have like a lot of traps, you should probably put in there, hey, probably a good idea to have a rogue with you. Or if it's going to have something that's got some things that only magic could get past, like you need to fly to a certain point or things like that. You could put in, hey, a wizard with the ability to cast fly or having a magic item such as flying carpet. You can put those things in the preamble. But for the most part, this assumes that the party dynamic is always going to be uh, approximately, you know, the classic fifth edition, you know, the bopper rogue, bopper being like, you know, <laughs> fighter barbarian or whatever, um, DPS spellcaster and cleric. But yeah, we'll, we can cover some of that. Christopher asks us, um... If you create your own creatures, uh, how do you determine their CR? Uh, we're not really covering monster making in this. There is a whole new section of rules, and frankly, it's like a it's almost another course I could teach. <laughs> um, <laughs> e there, if you look on page, uh, let's see, two hundred and seventy three, it tells you pretty much everything you need to know to create CRs for your monsters. Which uh, the, the short and ugly version of it is, it is a it is decided by a table called the Monster Statistics by Challenge Rating Table, which I've used so much it's actually started to fade in my book from my finger marks. And He's referring it, to chapter nine of the DMG for those online. Yeah, it um, it uh, that table 
basically cut small monsters into two cat like two different sections which you average out one being its defensive capabilities the other being its offensive capabilities you add those together divide by two and that's how you come up with your cr <laughs> so it's like i said it's it's i don't want to like get things mixed up in here but um it is like a totally different side of fifth edition creation um for the most part we're talking about things that already have established uh, we're going to be referencing things that already have established CRs, either by Wizards of the Coast or, you know, a reputable third party, you know, that's assigned a, um, a challenge rating for the creatures. But yeah, it's a good question. It's just, just monster making is like, you know, I, w I don't think it's as complicated as adventure making, but it definitely requires more than just a <laughs> five minutes of questions. But basically, you use the rules on creating a monster, determine its CR. That tells you how much experience it is worth. You plug it into mm -hmm. your into your encounter math about how much it takes up. Um, yeah. is it, we have several questions asking, essentially, um, is it only for combat encounters? Should we put the hard encounters first or last? Should we run three encounters or six encounters? These are good questions. Maybe we should wait till after the whole thing, um, so we don't get too mixed up in that. Because yeah, I mean, I these are get really good. Deep into it, but what I want to stress, like what we talked about last week, is when we t last week I stressed to you all that you as the DM don't solve the middle of the adventure for the players. This is one hundred yeah. percent that part of the content. You just account for how much the game thinks is fair for a party of the composition you're building for whether that be a very strict three, four characters at level three, or this is my home group. We've got two level seven characters, three level fives, and a level three who shows up every now and then. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. This is just and gonna tell you what's fair to deploy against them. And it's the, up to the players to figure out if that's what they're gonna be comfortable with, how they wanna go yeah. about doing it. There's, there's infinite combinations of players and DMs and characters and everything that are gonna be using if you're doing publishing now, if you're creating for your own table, obviously you can fine tune it for them. But when publishing, um, there's no way of knowing every single possible thing. You know, you get not even Doctor Strange could figure something out like that. <laughs> so you have to really make it for like the most common dynamic and then at least give enough notes to the DM to know uh, who's going to play your material to know the minimum of what they need for that. And then it's their job to adjust it. Otherwise, I mean, you, you know, you're, you'll go crazy. And what this system does is it ensures that I would say 80% of people who play through your adventure do so successfully. Right. <laughs> I mean, if you want to create like a tomb of horrors style adventure where you, you're just looking to kill some people. Yeah. You can totally do that too. But you know, these rules are meant to keep it balanced so that, um, and when I say balance, that it's not too easy and it's not too hard. It's a, that sweet spot where, like, yeah, they could potentially die, but, you know, you know, four times out of five, they should get through it okay with feeling tensions and feeling like it's fun. And that's really what these points help you measure um, to create a successful adventure. Last point I'll make before we continue an answer to a question. Uh, magic items are not accounted for in this. A party with magic items is always stronger than the, the encounter balance, but that is actually built into the game intentionally. The game wants yeah. players with items to feel good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there, there is a system for balancing magic items too, just so you know. Um, it's mostly in, in Xanathar's. It's like half a column. It's pretty easy to understand once you read it. Um, I don't think it's nearly as complicated as this, but basically it's like you get four uncommon items in tier one, like six in you know tier two and so on it's pretty simple um once you but th this one takes like a little bit more arithmetic to balance but yeah magic items can break games but again it's not you can't predict everything that they're going to have um like obviously like if there's a chasm in your adventure the party that's got all that's loaded up with brooms of flying are going to have no problem whereas the other <laughs> party that's got a rope and a grappling hook it's going to have a little bit more difficult time. And you can't guess all that stuff, you know. All you can do is just write the adventure to the best of your ability. And 20 foot gap is the hardest thing yeah. to deal with in D&D. &D. <laughs> yeah. First, first level adventure is pit, okay. All right, let's all right, um, We're going to keep going, well, y'all. Yeah. Remember, we, we, we'll do questions after the end of this. We got time. And then also in the Discord channel, too. So we know there's going to be a lot of questions related to uh, some of this content because it is the nitty gritty stuff. And um, it's, like I said, it's, it's, 
it's pretty easy, easy to understand. But yeah, there's always going to be a million possibilities about how things can play out. All right. All right. So I want to make sure that we really understand these two terms here. Uh, when calculating encounter difficulties and their points value, you must use the adjusted XP total and not the actual XP total. So an actual XP total is the number shown in the creature's stat block, generally in parentheses right after its challenge rating value under the challenge run. This is the number of experience points that the party earns for defeating the creature, obviously divided by the number of players. So if they fight a bugbear, which is worth 200 experience points, and there's four people, everybody gets 50 XP from beating it. However, this is not necessarily the value used to calculate the encounter's difficulty. So this this is where things can get a little tricky for some folks, okay? What you're going to use is the adjusted XP, which is a derivative of the actual XP that calculates how challenging the encounter is. This amount factors in um, two other things, the total number of monsters the party faces as well as the number of party members in the fight. This value is only underlined, only used for calculations and is never awarded to the party. And I'll show you how to, to calculate to get the adjusted XP value. All right. So to determine the adjusted XP cost for each of your encounters, first, what you do is you're going to add together all of the actual XP values for the monsters. So, for example, an encounter with four goblins would have an actual XP value of 200 XP. So 50 experience points times four goblins equals 200 actual XP. But then you have to modify the actual XP for multiple monsters using the encounter multipliers table, which I've included here in this image. It's also in the DMG right next to right in that same clump of pages with the Adventure Day XP and Challenge dif and, uh, Difficulties. So, for example, that same goblins, four goblin counter, should be multiplied by two because there's three to six monsters. That results in 400 adjusted XP. So to reiterate, we know that four goblins is worth 200 real or actual XP, but we have to multiply it by two to come up with the adjusted XP cost. Okay? Then, you're going to divide the adjusted XP by the number of characters. This helps you determine the difficulty of the encounter uh, per character. So, for example, if you divide the adjusted XP that we just came up for the four goblins, which was 400, you arrive at 100 adjusted XP. And then finally, you're going to want to cross-reference the adjusted XP value to the XP thresholds by character level table as it relates to the art average party level for the adventure so for example the goblin counter we just created for first level adventure would be deadly so let's kind of um let me go back a couple tables and show you the why so we had four goblins okay worth 50 experience each that's their real value so they have a real value of 200 xp if we divided that by four, it would be 50, which is a medium encounter. But that's wrong. It's not a medium encounter. All right. Because there are four in the party, you have to multiply it times two to come up with your adjusted XP value. Dividing that by four is 100. It is a deadly encounter. So four goblins are inherently more difficult than the sum of their parts, right? If you were to fight those four goblins one at a time, like I'm fighting one goblin, it dies, another one shows up, I kill that one, and so on, so you fought four. Yes, it would be like fighting four very simple encounters back to back. But when they're all together, they're more difficulty because like Hunter pointed out, there's more action economy involved. So they're gonna take up a little bit more resources. Uh, they would take up the double amount of resources because they're all there. Now remember, your adjusted XP is not what is rewarded to your party. They still get the raw XP value for the goblins. So even though it's like fighting monsters that are worth 100, 100 points each, you're only going to get 50 each. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm going to add do this one last part. There's one last piece here. So then... Um, although most of the adventures you write, uh, if you're going to publish, should be created for four characters, when creating adventures for smaller or larger parties, you must factor in another multiplier 
Um, so if the party contains fewer than three characters, you want to apply the next highest multiplier. So for example, if you create an encounter with four goblins, you would first multiply the actual value of the four goblins to get 200, then multiply it by 2.5 instead of two to get 500 to just experience because four goblins is a lot harder for, um, well, it's about the same, but it, <laughs> it's it's going to be harder for three characters than it would be for four characters. Okay, so three character, five hundred divided by three—that's what one hundred and sixty-seven um, per character now versus just the hundred that we had for four. All right. If the party contains six or more characters, you instead use the next lowest multiplier on the table. If it's just a single monster, you multiply it times 0.5. So a single monster doesn't have a whole lot of things that it can do against, you know, a party of six. So it becomes significantly more difficult. So, for example, if you created that same encounter with four goblins, first multiply the actual value, four goblins to get 200 XP, then multiply it times 1.5 instead of two to get 300 adjusted XP. And now for a party of six, that's only 50 XP or 50 adjusted XP each. It's a very simple, uh, very, a medium encounter for them versus being deadly like it would for a party of four. Um, but yeah, the too long didn't read on this is that if you have three or um, less, then you, or excuse me, just less than three, Never mind the, uh, if you have less than three, you're gonna go up one level, okay? So two becomes times two, three to six becomes 2.5, seven to 10 becomes three and so on, okay? And if you've got six or more, um, then it is going to go down one level and then you at it's 0.5 for one. So one becomes that, two becomes times one, three to six becomes 1.5 and so on. Okay, so this is basically how encounter multipli multipliers work, which is why um, mobs will always feel more difficult for a party than not having mobs. And this is the amount that your actual encounters cost. Okay, this is probably one of the more complicated parts of encounter balance, so I'm sure there are some questions. <laughs> uh, Sarge, what we got? <laughs> Um, let's step back a slide. Michael wanted some clarification on a point. He said for point yep. three here, is it divided by the number of players or the number of goblins? By the number of players or the number of ah, yeah, characters. Have, I'm sorry. We have a typo on that one. Sorry about that one, Mike. What did I, where is it? Divide the adjusted XP by the number of characters. This helps you determine the counter of the characters, for example. That's, that's right. We, did, we, we mentioned goblins, I think. No, it's four goblins. Well, it's, I think it's divided by the four. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. My bad. Okay. Just gonna, yeah, we. Sorry about that, Michael. Let's yeah, see. It's... Scott asked us so for a party of three, would it increase or just one to two? I don't understand. Oh, the, the multiplier is affected by small parties and large parties. Uh, the DMG offers guidance for that. Yeah. You are yeah. uh, somebody's asking about do we encounter and like include NPCs as characters in the in the camera it, here? That's generally, a good generally yes, particularly if they're competent. Yeah, you'll have to figure out their level and keep in mind that the the CR rating of an NPC is not indicative of its level. CRs and levels are very different. Um, I found after breaking out the math on a few of the different um, classes that it roughly translates to um, the CR is roughly 75% of what its level would be. So a 20th level character would be like fighting a CR 15 monster. And there's, there's some other factors that kind of change that. Yeah, but put that in perspective, like Vadra yeah. Safar, the black staff, one of the most powerful wizard NPCs is only CR like 12 or 13. Yeah. If the NPC if you're writing an NPC into your adventure and they can actually contribute um, in a meaningful way, meaning that they can actually deal damage, um, then yes, they should be counted as, um, they should effectively be counted as a character. But if it's just like a commoner that's, you know, 
hiding under a rock. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't count that. He's really just though. You still have to to factor in the fact like how many hit points they have because a um, you know, a, like even if a commoner has a club and they can deal two damage per turn, um, if they're with a party of fifth level characters, they are not really that effective. I mean, they're they're weaker than a first level character, um, because first level character could do significantly more damage. But yeah, it really like I said, it really the 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 question the answer is it depends. <laughs> Uh, folks want some clarity on when do the uh, multiplier changes it when there's two or less players or three or less players? It is if they are fewer than three characters. So in other words, there are two characters or less. Um, and even then, uh, the game isn't really balanced that well for two or two or one characters, um, but it becomes significantly harder. If you've got kids and you've ever run a session with some kids and it's just like one or two at a time, you'll notice real quick that they're going to have some trouble because your typical encounter is going to be much deadlier um, because the the goblins are going to have, you know, goblins or whatever they're fighting are going to have a little bit more action economy. Um, but yeah, between three and five, it uses your basic multiplier. So if you call back to when I said talking about preamble, when you're writing your ventures, you almost always say this adventure is designed between three and five characters. That's because the math is simpler that way. When it gets to down two or less, or if it gets six or higher, it starts changing things significantly. Uh, and then APL calculation is something else that's worth uh, considering too. APL is your average party level. Your average party level is basically a fancy way of saying add together all of your characters' levels and divide it by four. And it's always divided by four for APL specifically. That's if you want to do Adventurers League type writing. Uh, let's see. We have a couple of questions about the Tasha's sidekicks and how we would include them in the CR calculations. I would include them as a party member. Um, they they may be marginally weaker, but um, they level up at about the same pace as the party. Um, so it's like having an extra hand. Um, Seeing the way Wizards has used them in some of their published material, uh, somebody mentioned, are they half a PC? Almost! That seems to be how Wizards kind of uses them, but they're a little more potent than that. Yeah, they're pretty strong. I mean, even though, like, ultimately, they're the thing. It here's the thing with the sidekicks is they are balanced more or less the same way that levels are. The one thing that they're missing is options because too many options would just bog down play if you had a sidekick. But in terms of like pure damage output, I mean, the spellcasters level right. They're basically a full caster, so a full caster can cast you know cone of cold at level nine and uh, you know fireball at level five they're doing the same damage output. Their hit points are approximately, in fact, I think their hit points are better because they're based on, uh, what is it? 4.5 per level. So, you know, yeah, they're, they're absolutely a full thing. It's just, they don't have all the options it does because they're a robot and having to juggle that many extra options is probably too much for a table. So yeah, I would count them as a full party member personally. Um, they haven't, I don't think Wizards of the Coast has come out and said directly how to do it, but knowing what I know of the math, and since most of it is balanced around um, hit points and the ability to reduce hit points, uh, of which they are on par with characters of the same level, my experience would say yes, count them. Uh, we have questions about whether or not websites out there like Hobo Fight Club and 5e Tools use this math. Yes. Yep, 100%. That's, uh, that's all they did was take all this stuff and automate it for you. Um, now, there are some peculiarities in some of the stuff. Like, here's... Okay, so going back to the talk about tiers. Um, you know, you've got four tiers in D&D. You know, first, second, third, and fourth. One through four, five through 10, 11 through 16, and 17 up. Um most of this mathematics works really well for first and second tier, okay? But once the party reaches approximately level seven to level nine and gets the, like, death starts, stops becoming a danger and there's no real obstacles for the party anymore, it kind of starts to fall apart <laughs> a little bit. And um, which is why you will see that Wizards of the Coast does not put out a lot of content that is above 10th level. Um, there's one book currently 
that goes above 10th level. And that's, that's mad mage, but also arguably they put you into a situation where you are kind of hampered to use some of your biggest powers to circumvent some of the dangers of the, the dungeon. Um, and the, the, all the other ones that go past uh, 11th level, you're already kind of like, you know, there's, there's momentum in the adventure. So like in rhyme of the frost man, you're, you're going towards the end goal at that point. You don't notice that, you may not notice you're specifically as powerful as you are. Um, where was I going with all this, Sarge? I forgot where I started. <laughs> um, we were talking about how the CR system and the encounter building system oh, yeah, yeah. can fall so off. So at low levels, at low levels system. for sure. If you're gonna write, for, if you're gonna write for third or fourth tier, and I don't recommend doing it until you've got um, at least some experience under your belt and you really understand um, kind of the, the construction of the game, the um, those are going to work really well, especially for low-level adventures. Um, certainly make sure you keep level one balanced. And even then, level one is one that I would use almost with kid gloves. And you will see that Wizards of the Coast and their own first-level adventures, especially in some of their newer books, are um, being a little bit more gentle, uh, excluding Avernus. Avernus is deadly. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to throw a bandit captain plus five bandits at you as your first-level character. like, what? <laughs> um the uh uh it's but for like third level characters it's like almost perfect like you can balance and you can balance you can put like four hard or three deadline encounters up against the party and you can just see it happen like they start out like yeah we're doing good and then by the time they get done with that last fight they're like oh need a long rest and like the math is like perfect so definitely for first tier the math is really good second tier it's pretty good third tier it starts falling apart Something that I I want to point out here while we're talking about this, uh, before we get to, and we're going to move on with the next bit of, of content here. What you'll see in Wizards products for Tier 2 characters often, those player characters often go into large-scale dungeons that require multiple adventuring days to clear. Uh, when you are designing your dungeons for this, and this is a little more beyond what we're going to teach you, because we want you guys to focus on about level three for four characters in a single session, smaller dungeon. There's two things you have to remember. One, the party by rules can only benefit from a long rest once per 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So your dungeon will need to include either safety regions for the players to discover and rest in, or you will need to allow the party to retreat. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your dungeon's going to be too hard. Yeah, well, and then arguably also at higher levels, they have easier ways to get that in. But the this is also, keep in mind, this is also balanced um, for two short rests in between your long rests, too. I forgot to mention that. But yeah, they, they factor that in. So if short rest is a question, that is factored into this, um, typically one or two per day. Um, but then, yeah, like like I said, like this is why when you're writing, like we say, when you're starting off writing, the easiest thing for you to learn how to do is to do like a 10 room dungeon that's got five encounters. Those five encounters use all of your adventuring day XP. The party goes in feeling strong, leaves it like, whoo, bone daddy sure was tough. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's, it's, it's when you do it, it's like, you feel like those are going to be the one it's the ones that are balanced the best are the ones that people are going to remember the most because it creates just wonderful tension all the way through and it doesn't take too long you do a bigger dungeon and they're going to want to retreat midway through because after they fight five to six you know six to eight encounters um they want to get out of there um if you do it too small or if you do just a single off like encounter um like one a party fighting just one deadly encounter they're not really going to feel challenged and they're going to be like oh that guy was a chump you know mm -hmm. um so that's why it's really important. Like people will ask me like, hey, I want to create a boss. What CR should I set it for? And my question is never, like I never tell them, oh, you should do this because of this level. I'm like, well, there's a lot of factors. Are they rested? Are they going to rest shortly after? Did they fight anything before it? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because these are all considerations built into this uh, uh, arithmetic that comes with the game. Yeah. One of the things we stress a lot when we're writing stuff and we're helping our other writers, dungeons have ecology to them. Like, there's usually, like, two factions of the dungeon. If the dungeon has, like, goblins who live there, there's probably also spiders hanging out and oozes hanging out. And it's the num it's the collective trouble that the party goes through on their objective within the dungeon that makes it hard. So, like, when you're playing Lost Minds of Fandelver, you don't encounter Clark 
at full strength. You guys are tired by the time you find Clark. You've gone through six goblins, three wolves, likely two more goblins, likely three more goblins, and then you fight Clark with two goblins and a wolf. Mm -hmm. So that's why he's so tough. Yeah, if you just fought him in a vacuum, he'd be really easy. But the fact is, he's a CR1 monster with like three CR one quarter backup. Um, gosh, it's crazy that I memorized like every encounter. I've only run it once. And I, <laughs> I think it's just so, so well classic. done. It's really it good. It is really well done. It is really <laughs> well done. Um, but one of my adventures, I wrote, I wrote Bone Daddy, has, or AKA Shrine of the Emperor of Bones in. I think it probably took me all of 45 minutes to write it and and get it balanced. And it's I use exactly this arithmetic for first level. And yeah, like I, I played it myself and I'm like, dang, this really does put you up to the line. Like we left that dungeon wanting to take a long rest. <laughs> really cool how it kind of works out because you you really feel and like when you want to write really solid content, this stuff's really fun to know. And it's good for your party too, because they'll be like, "You're like a master dungeon master." <laughs> I'm right. gonna say it just like that. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <laughs> um. Did I do this one already? Okay. We so this is just. Fired. Yeah, this is just um kind of going back, and this works in kind of the multipliers. Okay, so this is basically the same slide you saw in the beginning. The buying the encounters or the overview, but now it's got all that complex stuff in there. All right. So <clears throat> remember again, step one, determine your daily adventuring XP budget using the rules we discussed earlier. For example, first level adventure has a daily, daily adventuring XP budget of 1200 XP, 300 XP times four characters. Okay. Next, determine the adjusted XP value for each of your encounters. So, for example, if you have an encounter with four goblins, the adjusted XP value for the encounter is 400 because it's 50 experience points times four goblins times two for the encounter multiplier for three to six monsters. Next, determining difficulty for the encounter, you divide the adjusted XP by the number of characters for the level you're building the encounter. Then cross-reference that number with the XP threshold by character's level table. It's that long one with the green lines. Um, so if you divide 400 adjusted XP by the number of players, you come up with 100, which is a deadly encounter for first level characters. Then you subtract the adjusted XP value for the whole thing from your daily adventuring XP budget. So for example, if you subtract that value of that goblin encounter made in step two from the daily adventuring budget, you've got 800 adjusted XP remaining. In other, in other words, two more encounters just like that one. So three deadly goblin encounters. And that's pretty much it. Rinse, wash, repeat until you run out of points and you got yourself a dungeon. All right, I think. All right, so I am going to open up a spreadsheet now, and I'm going to show you exactly how to do all this. So give me a second. Sorry, if you want to ask a question or two while I'm, or answer a question or two while I'm loading this thing up. Yeah, I don't mind. Uh, do people have any questions about how to go about using that? While you all are asking questions, I will just ramble. Uh, I think one of the most important things about understanding the math behind encounter design is it lets you run other people's published content more efficiently. I find that when you can understand the encounter design behind encounters, you can feel more confident running stuff. Like for example, today, Ducky running some content in Rime of the Frost Maiden for us decided that our seventh level party should not fight two white dragon wormlings. Ducky upgraded them to two young white dragons. And when we were like, what the hell, Ducky? <laughs> she said to us with a straight face, this is a medium encounter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> That's basically well, it. Um, there are six of us in the party, so they're correct. <laughs> yep. Let's see. Uh, we went too fast. Did we deduct the actual XP or adjusted XP from the adventuring XP? We had we subtracted the adjusted XP. So four goblins for a level one for four part characters at level one is going to be four hundred adjusted experience. We subtract the four hundred from the twelve hundred total, and we have eight hundred remaining for future encounters. Yep. So I'm going to show you exactly what all that means right now. This is my encounter planning sheet. And I realized I need to fix the one I sent all you 
all of you last week. So I, sh I need to get that done tonight. Remind me to do this, Sarge, after we're done. <laughs> um, I'm going to do a third level adventure for four characters. If you look at your um, adventuring day XP table, you will see that that would be 1200, or excuse me, um, yeah, 1200 adjusted XP per character for a grand total of 4,800. So that's what this column is here says, and this one will subtract it as I start adding encounters. Um, I haven't really given a name to any of these areas yet, but I'm gonna create kind of a virtual, let's pretend this is like a six room dungeon here that I'm creating. And each one's gonna have an encounter in it. So first, let's say my first encounter is gonna be, let's say six goblins, okay? At 50 experience each, that's going to be 600 actual XP. That's a multiplier of two. CR1 oh, yeah, sorry. 300. I'm thinking of there. Their adjusted XP is 600, which per character is going to be 150. If we look at our um, encounter difficulty XP per character for a third level party, 150 is a medium encounter. All right, and you can see it's already subtracted the 600 from the total. So I've got 4,200 left. Let's say the next room is going to have three bugbears. Uh, yeah, three bugbears. That's 200 each. That's 600 actual XP. That's a multiplier of two for 1,200. And then per character, that's going to be 300. 300 for a third level party is uh, kind of in between hard and deadly. We're going to say hard. All right. Now, let's do something a little bit uh, different. Let's say there's one Zorn in there, Sarge. There's a Zorn yes. in there. Yes. Zorn is a CR5 monster. Gib, gib. You, don't have any, you don't have any gems, so he wants to eat your face. Um, Oh, give Jim or you yeah, eat he you. Can, he can tell that the wizard's got something really important on him. He wants to give it to me. Yeah, he's a I solo monster, <laughs> so his multiplier is times one for a party of four. Uh, the adjusted XP is the same as the normal. And at 800, 1800 by four characters, that is 450, which is going to make him a deadly encounter. So one Zorn. A deadly Zorn. You don't I give Jim. Do You're going to get killed. And you can see this has been reducing the number of adjusted XP that I have left to spend. So I've got probably about another two encounters left in the tank. Let's do, how about, let's do five cobalts plus one ogre. Or, you know what? Let's do two ogres. Whoa. All right. So two ogres, that's 900 plus five cobalts is uh, 125. So that's 1025. So it's 25 for each cobalt, and then 450 for each ogre brings us to 1025. This is our multiplier this time is going to be 2.5. I'm going to put in a real quick thing right here. So 2.5 times 1025 is 2562. We divide that by four. Whoa, now that's super duper deadly, right? Hard to believe that two ogres and a bunch of kobolds could be that deadly. So what I may have told myself here is either I want a really, really, really deadly encounter, but since this is much higher than the 400 for a normal deadly encounter, I might want to rethink this. Let's do one ogre plus three goblins instead. That's going to be 600, which is two, and then it's just going to be a hard encounter, okay? So the points have told me, hey, Dave, you're making this, that's way too hard. Not only is it too hard for a single encounter, because it's at 150% of what a deadly encounter should be, and it's probably going to like really wreck some people. It also went to pass my remaining adjusted XP. So since I've typed in these four encounters here, you can see my remaining adjusted XP has gone to zero. I've pretty much built out all the encounters for that, which will be six goblins in one encounter, three bugbears in another encounter, the meanest Zorn you'll ever meet, and then an ogre and three goblins. And that is basically how it's done. It's pretty nifty. I uh, always have to reset this thing. So, In uh, your own writing, you could take those encounters and you can move them around to different rooms. Like you can split them up. Like if you had a 10 room dungeon, you can split those up and give some gaps between the rooms so they're not getting yeah. hit room after room. Sometimes the presence of the rooms encounters being close to each other in 
nearby areas can potentially trigger the next room to come in after the fight is over yeah. or l allow the next room to prepare so the party is going to have a difficult time gaining surprise. Yeah. Um, yeah, remember with your objectives too, your um if you if you haven't already, really make sure to read Keith Amon's um The Monsters Know What They're Doing. Or you can just check out his website, uh www.themonstersknow.com. It talks a lot about monster tactics and ecology. Um, because they're you know, they sh as a D I mean, this is really gonna come to the DM that you're writing for. And if you are that DM, they're gonna be thinking, breathing, living things. Um so what do they do if there's a fight in the next room? Do they go, oh shit, adventures are here, let's go. Or do they pick up their spears and get ready? Or do they go back and play more Xbox with the Zorn? You know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> we love Zorn uh, around here, guys. You have no idea. <laughs> Zorn are pretty funny. They're, they're so weird. Um, but yeah, like, it's it's all these things are, are factors in there. Um but for the most part, like I said, I've created four encounters that will that will challenge a third level party. Um, when those encounters are, doesn't really matter because they're all using up the same percentage of XP. It's really just how do you want to place them in terms of what makes sense in your in your dungeon um, or whatever. I say dungeon. When I say dungeon, I mean location, like or area. Um, the ones they face first are always going to feel easiest. So even if they're fighting the Zorn is the first thing, if they're fully rested and they've got something that can pierce its hide, they're going to feel like it's pretty easy. But if it's the last thing they face, it's going to feel like it's the hardest thing that they've ever fought, right? Just because this. But in the end, it all balances out to be the same. So, uh, Folks are asking, how do you account for traps? If you have them in your dungeon with the yeah, it's a great question, and I gotta dungeon. add a slide about that. Uh, traps. So anything really that is going to be an encounter should be something that's going to drain resources, and traps have the potential to drain, drain resources in the terms of dealing damage and um, removing hit points. Um, and then like too, like they could potentially remove other things, like if it's a uh, you know a wizard might cast fine traps on it or something um, and use a spell slot. Um, there are rules for that in Xanathar's Guide in chapter... Brrr, never remember. One of these chapters. Uh, uh, in, near the end of chapter two. When they yeah, end of chapter two, stuff. there's an experience reward here for it. That applies to complex traps. It's not just like a goblin yeah. a thing. Yeah, like for... And the reason it's for complex traps is because complex traps go on for multiple rounds and the game is balanced so that most parties will handle encounters, whether it be a monster or a trap, within three rounds. Um, I would say for a trap, whatever... Da What's the easiest way to put this? Whatever damage it does, if it's just a simple trap, divide that by three and <laughs> and look and make it account to your monster statistics table. The too long didn't read is... Unless it's a trap-heavy dungeon, it's not going to make that much of a dent in it. Like, if you're just doing one or two traps, like, it's not a big deal. Especially if they don't do heavy damage. I would refer would to Zane the Press Guide. Yeah, we've probably oh. said that the contents rolls sort of tell you that traps are kind of built into the the balance related to the party fighting creatures. Because if you're using yeah. contents table guidance, about half the rooms are creatures, and about about a quarter of them are traps. Yeah. And and really, when you're writing, traps, traps are less. Traps are really more puzzles. Um, in my early days of writing, I like to surprise people with traps, but these days I realize it's better from a writing standpoint and from a game development standpoint that characters can find them easy and avoid them because um, surprising traps is just just annoying all you're doing is subtracting hit points and you're just going to irritate players and if that's what you're going for and your players like it by all means but in terms of just writing like telegraphing this stuff and we'll go over a lot of this when we talk about like actually writing the adventure which will be next week um you know you, you really want to have like telegraph stuff like you know um a party that the first door they shock their hand on because they didn't check it right and they take three damage. It's annoying, but it's not going to kill them. But it's also going to tell them, hey, there's probably traps in this dungeon. Look out. <laughs> uh, you know, all, anybody who's walked down a long hallway in D&D &D knows, okay, there's a pit somewhere, you know, down this damn hallway. I know there is. You know, these are the um, these are the things that you want to write as 
as a trap. Now, some traps like complex traps are really more like fighting a monster than they are like, um, uh, uh, you know, like a tr traditional trap. So those are a little bit different. Um, and really, if you want to learn all about traps and balances, Xanathar's chapter two is going to be your your source for that. But I would say always err on the side of your trap not doing too much damage, um, especially if you're not telegraphing it well, because you don't want a trap to TPK a party and they had no way that it could have been there. Like, would you play a video game where the moments that you logged in, somebody shot you and you had nothing to do to protect yourself? It's the same thing when designing traps. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely something that comes with finesse. Hayden asks us, how do we recognize and avoid adventure encounter design that's most likely going to end in a TPK? Sometimes um, that's the goal, Hayden. <laughs> honestly, sometimes we intentionally design encounters that are, are like exceeding, are intentionally above. Um, yes, the but you, really expand. But that goes back to our first slide, doesn't it? the objective of an encounter. So if you put, if you have a, I recently wrote an adventure that is for seventh level characters and has a solar in it and a dragon turtle, two creatures, which could wreck um, a seventh level party. A uh, dragon turtle, they might stand a chance against, but a solar for sure would just kill them. wreck them. Yeah. And the point of the solar wasn't to fight. The objective for the players was to prove their value so that they could, <laughs> so frankly, they could live. Um, and also there were some other things leading up to it, which would avoid an encounter with the solar. So if you follow the points that are shown here and you keep things within the realm of the easy, medium, hard, or deadly um, in terms of what they actually have to fight, there shouldn't be a TPK. Um, if you... But if you throw in an encounter like that, that two ogres that I made with the five kobolds, yeah, by all means, that's the last encounter the party's going to face. They will most certainly die because we have used up all their resources before then. You know, they blew their fireball or they don't have a fireball. They're third level party. They blew their like area of effect spells, taking out those uh, goblins. They used a lot of heavy hitting stuff to try to get through that Zorn. They, you know, uh, what else did I have in there? Like, uh, was there bugbears? Yeah, like they had to really fight out some bugbears. And then you throw like two ogres and, and a bunch of kobolds with advantage on every one of their attacks. Yeah, you're going to TPK them. But that's why I got rid of it and changed it back to something that's a little bit more easy. Um, it's where now, it's how like a medium encounter can become terrifying. The mm -hmm. Essentials Kit has a, an encounter like this for the first or second level party. When they're leaving Dwarven Excavation, the parties fought a bunch of oozes, survived a big trap. They're probably not feeling too great. And then orcs equal to the party size show up. And that that's real scary for a level one or two party after you've already used all your features. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just gotta balance, you just gotta look at the balance of the, the points. And when you get more experience and get a feel for it, um, especially when you start really writing it, you know more how to telegraph the deadliness to the dm so that they can in turn telegraph it to the players because um if you don't you know it's it's really like playing a tele game of telephone right you are going to be ha handing this information to the dm and they they trust you because you're the person who wrote it so you need to make sure that your ducks are in the row in the background so that they can effectively um play through this content with their players and not end up killing them now if you want to create stuff that's more difficult, you can, but you still want to use um, sort of the raw points that are in there. I've created some adventures that go to 120 to 130 percent of the daily adventuring XP, but they are designed to be um, advanced player challenges because, like, you know, like uh, what's the one I do with all the raids, Sarge? Assault on the uh... assault on the umbral haunted and infernal fortresses. Yeah, all of those are designed to be extra hard. All my dragon layers are designed to be hard, but it's there in the content. And it says it like, hey, if you want to make this really hard, do this. Um, and that way the DM can decide whether or not they want to do it. But that's, you know, that's sort of advanced writing. But still, I broke down the numbers. I, I figured out how tough each encounter was. I got it down to the exact number that I wanted to, knowing exactly what the end effect would be. And you, you have to do more or less the same thing yourself. Like I said, it's all cooking. Uh... Eric's asking us, uh, do you make encounters harder or easier than the Matt says by using tricks like terrain, surprise, etc.? And how do you estimate that? 
it, the DMG it actually really, gives guidance in the same section. It says step it up yeah. in one. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It really depends on again. Like, there's really only one or two levers that are in the background of the design of this game, and that's going to be the um, value of hit points and the amount of damage that you can do. And anything that is going to add defensive capabilities to uh, your encounter is going to up the defensive value of them and potentially make their CR, like their their virtual CR, if you will, harder. Because bugbears fighting in a room, you know, with just a, a table and chairs, yeah, those are CR1 monsters. But bugbears in a hot air balloon, you know, <laughs> shooting on you from above on a first level party, like, yeah, what are you going to do? You know, other than like try to get the balloon. Mm, you bugbears. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's really going to depend on that. Um, review chapter th what is it chapter three and it'll kind of tell you a little bit more of that but just remember if it affects their defensive or their damage output you're probably gonna have to do it otherwise if it's just something like like if you're all in difficult terrain and they have the same problem as you you're on even ground right it's like uh it's like being in the dark fighting somebody right they have advantage on you because uh you can't see them but they can't see you so you know, it cancels out. <laughs> Ted is asking us, how do we keep parties from splitting our content into two separate adventuring days by taking a long rest in the middle of the dungeon? You don't. That's up to your DM. Um, really, if you if you do the points, um, if you do the points the way it's supposed to be, the party should be able to go through it. Um, if they want to take a long rest in the middle of the dungeon, you just do what I do. Call them a bunch of wusses. And let them do it. Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, really, if you're balancing it right, they shouldn't need to. But some some parties just do that. They play it safe and they go and they, you know, especially when they start getting like Magnificent Mansion and shit where they can just go in there and be like, hey, hey, hang on. Go into extra dimension. We're going to stone shape a wall here, Dave. We're going to cast Magnificent Mansion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, we're in Lehman's tiny hut. Go away. Um, the You know, it's, it's, yeah, again, like as long as you're balancing it right, if a DM's going to run it that way, you do it. I mean, obviously, you can do it by map design too. So if your map doesn't really have a place that makes sense for a long rest, it's not going to work. And you could put in notes in there. It's like, hey, if the party leaves and come back, these guys may have called some of their friends. Uh, Forge of Fury is a good example of that. It's in Yawning Portal. It says, like, look, so a bunch of the guys are currently out of the office, like doing some other orky stuff. If you leave and come back, they're going to be there next time with reinforcements so you know you better beat them up the first time <laughs> uh somebody's asking us about random encounters in the encounter mm -hmm. balance usually they're i think they design out to be like an additional medium encounter so yeah. you can probably program them to occur maybe like once or twice a day as two medium encounters yeah the random encounters are unique because they their purpose is misunderstood um you will see in a lot of modern Wizards of the Coast design is that random encounters usually um, are occur on the way somewhere, like when you're traveling to add sort of like flavor to the scene and also kind of like do something more interesting than, you know, just, you know, humping across um, Faerun or whatever um, on the way there. In dungeons, it's become a lot more rare in Wizards content. I, th I can only think of maybe like one or two adventures i think in uh what's the last dungeon in fandover called the oh, fandover no way uh, something wave fine. crushing wave wave yeah anyways that one i think has a oh, random man. encounter table but it'll even say like hey use this if the party's kind of putzing around or you know they haven't really felt any challenges yet it's more of it's more of like if you're if you if you consider like balancing your adventure cooking, it's like putting a salt shaker on the table for them. Hey, if you need more seasoning, <laughs> you can add it. But we should have put enough in there for you. Thank you, Chad. It is Wave Echo Cave. Yes, Wave Echo. That's it. Whatever. It's the it's that one. It's Fandelver. It is the man the lost mine of Fandelver. So anyways. <laughs> a lot of misnomers in that one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's give them the Yeah, homework. let's get through the yeah, and then we'll uh we'll uh homework. Oh, leave the link. Make sure you sign up for the next class on writing the adventure. Okay, oh, all the math's done. Oh thank god, thank you, Dave. Yeah, all that math is done. 
now you understand it. You're masters at it. You're going to get plenty of practice. Next class is going to be writing the adventure, which is the fun part. Um, also, in addition to signing up for that next class, which you definitely want to do, because how could you miss out on these beautiful faces? Um, I'm like pointing to you, Sarge. Uh. Uh, <laughs> make sure you create your encounters on your planning sheet. I'm going to get you guys a better planning sheet that does it, but basically just do like what I did in there to see um, how many have it. I'll get one that's got some formulas and stuff, so it automatically does it for you. It will be pretty nifty. Uh, review, re bleh, review chapter three of the five of the DMG. Really try to understand some of the, um, the encounter balancing stuff, especially if some of this was complicated. Uh, the slides are going to be included in your big master resource sheet that I gave you last week, too. So you should be able to review that if you need. And of course, you know, you can work with the channel. I highly recommend this week, too. Like if, if arithmetic is not your strong suit, go into the Discord, the uh, How to Write Table Top RPGs Adventures um, channel or whatever it's called and pair up with some people who may have a little bit stronger uh, concept of it. Not Sarge and I, of course, you know, we're usually busy <laughs> doing mm -hmm. whatever whatever it is that we have, to, whatever million tasks we have for that day. But that's what the people in the channel, like, you know, make some friends, figure out some people, because honestly, you could end up coming out with people you end up collaborating with in the future if you want to do this professionally. Uh, that, Jeff. What's that? Oh, I gave him an invalid indict. Oh, um uh, bonus review one of your favorite fifth edition adventures particularly a one shot some good examples include uh cragmall hideout and lost mine of fandelver uh what's one we mentioned that's one in incident uh, with clark uh some any of the sunless citadel content in tales of the yawning portal sinister secret of soft marsh is like a master class in adventure um first level adventure design and then a beautiful mine in Rime of the Frost Maiden is a nice little like second, third level uh, dungeon with cobalts and grail. And cobalt alone. Stuff. Cobalt alone is yeah. a little advanced in the design area, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cobalt alone is 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 more of an experiment than anything. It's fun. But yeah, that that's definitely more advanced. Try to go for something that's like a little bit more like classic. I think Cragmall Hideout's pretty freaking well balanced um, in Lost Mine of Fandelver. Sean is then, asking us about reviewing third-party content. The reason we didn't put any third-party content is, I mean, we can't we can't vet anyone else's stuff offhand. Yeah, Most I mean, if you want to if you want to look at ours, yeah, look at Shrine of the Emperor of Bones. I think is a big favorite among a lot of people. Um, Haunts what's of the my Ice werewolf? Cavern. Haunts of the yeah. Ice Cavern is at first and third level. Yeah. Um, pretty pretty much everything I do is uses the math. I mean, there's some, sometimes the I wing it, but yeah, Throne to the Wolves is another good one. It's werewolves for was that fifth level? At fifth level, and then first yeah. level is the big plant that's going to eat you. Yeah, first level <laughs> the Kieranborn Prince is a traps dungeon, Gideon. It's not really a yeah, not yeah, really yeah, a normal Kier dungeon. Kieranborn's pretty aggressive <laughs> um, too. And again, like that was a, a period where I was just writing. Like, oh, I almost killed some people. He was like, I don't like players. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'd say um, Shrine of the Emperor Bones for sure is like, that's about as classic as it comes in terms of writing. But any of those, Salt, Salt Marsh is like, is really on, like, really well designed. Um, not everything in that book is well designed. There's some shitty design in there. <laughs> but um, that one in particular is really nice. All right. Um, There's nothing we, wrong with the encounter sheet. We were just going to go back through it and make sure we add. The yeah, I, I want to put in formulas for you to make it easier. That's it. Um, so, uh, all right. And of course, you know, oh, we're still. Missing. Hmm. Oh, yeah. No, it's right here. Boop. Of course, um, we are still holding our how to become a content professional class. So if you are interested in the professional side of this and earning a comfortable living creating content, um starting i think would be a month from today in march right around this time um we will be holding that class for you uh you'll learn how to develop a brand for yourself leverage social media to gain followers uh how to create content that your fans want and we'll cover all the different monetization methods kickstarter patreon shopify amazon drive through you name it we know how to do it it's all pretty simple and easy to do um i love talking about it and uh, so far, we've got a pretty good response. We got like 70 people or so signed up. So our price will be going up because we want to try to keep it intimate. 
So if you haven't signed up already, uh, click on the offers button there. Go ahead and sign up, and we will let you know more. We'll probably have a um, workshop class open up on Discord pretty soon just for folks who sign up with that. It'd be pretty nifty. Probably for some folks asking about what days of the week we're going to hold the class. We're probably going to do it twice a week for the Euro crowd yeah. and the American crowd, depending on the demand. But we want to make sure we yeah. can we can interface more directly with the folks. Yeah, and you'll have access to the videos and stuff too. They won't be like on YouTube and accessible by anybody. But um, you know, if you can't make it like one class for whatever reason, we'll make sure you're taken care of. And you will be working more closely with um, at least myself. Uh, I don't know what Sarge will be doing, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be, be there trying to finish half the products or trying to get out the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Since this is since this is a little bit more tight knit group, it, it's a little bit easier for me to like actually come in and and help out and do stuff and and kind of review what you got. So it should be pretty fun. Um, yeah, w with twelve hundred students writing adventures, though, that's that's a different thing. <laughs> but yeah, that's why I say like find somebody to pair up with in our Discord channel if you want to. You know, if, if some of the arithmetic side is not your strong suit or next week, like if English is not your strong suit, you know, they can have somebody can help with that. Um, we got about 20 minutes left in this room until it expires. So I figure we'll take some questions and then we'll go to the discord where you will hear me um, talk until I pass out. So <laughs> uh, we will probably do the class again for folks who are asking about it, but we probably won't do it again until late spring, early summer at the earliest because our schedule is going to get real busy in a couple of months or some things that we yeah. have in store. Yeah, we've we've been really getting pretty busy. Um, we're finishing up our last Kickstarter now. We've got this class. We've got the class after it. We've got some new some new hires coming through. Um, so we are pretty busy. I mean, I'd love to hold it all the time. Um, but yeah, definitely, if, if this is something you want to do sooner rather than later, highly recommend signing up um, and trying to make it work with your schedule because really it's, um, I mean, look, you can, o you can always do this kind of stuff, but obviously you want to get a head start <laughs> and, and jump out there, especially if you're working a nine to five job and you're like, Oh, I can't take it anymore. You know, <laughs> like I was, you know, a year ago. So I hope you're not that way, Sarge. Do you feel that way about me? Can't take it anymore. No, not usually. Oh, what? Not usually. She's Some days never. I'm tired. Some days I'm tired and I just want to go take a nap. <laughs> this is... Uh, what's, our, well, what's our word for the day? I was going to say inexorable, but I don't think that's the right use of the word. Inexorable is the word of the day. <laughs> Inexorable? Inexorable is the word of the day. That's going to be the name of the new like organization I'm going to write up for my game. The Inexorable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah what questions do people have what can we yeah let's see with? uh they thought america's practically off to the printers it's really close but we're waiting on some things to clear up in china so we can mail all the stuff yeah they are on vacation for like a month and um we're sprinting out to get it done but it should be right around we should have roll 20 done probably by next week uh, and then a finalized version of the PDF, um, really just fixing some of the typos and putting it into a not so Wizards of the Coast looking template, uh, which is what Scott's working on right now. And he's got all these color charts that he's showing me. I'm like, oh, yeah, those are all great. <laughs> like a Mardi Gras color spread. I was like, yes, Carnival, let's do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hope you're all practicing Lint. Stop eating that red meat. Um, <laughs> yeah, like Lou, you know, obviously we. You know, we we felt the same challenges that all larger companies did. I looked at, and frankly, like like Fantasy Flight, for example, like their schedules like all a year behind. Granted, they're twenty times bigger than us, but still, I mean, it is what it is. But yeah, it's all on the way. Should be fun. James uh, is asking us about the updates to the adventure planning sheet. Uh, when we update it, you'll need to make a new copy. The copy that you made from it is not going to update when we modify. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll guys. Sure, I... I'll make sure Dave fixes it tonight before he goes to sleep. I'm going to sleep right now, sir. Yep. I failed you all. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get that all fixed up. We're just going to put, I mean, you can do it manually using the one I got you, but. Um, it's called uh, uh, Grown to the Wolves the um, formula. CT. Yeah. Basically, you fight a bunch of werewolves in a dungeon, in a cave. And um, what's funny is when I ran it for my own party, uh, they just 
set a fire at the front of the cave and smoked them out. So, <laughs> so I mean, you can't plan for stuff like that. So maybe I should have put an egress in there somewhere, but oh well. Uh, Drew, you just go to the adventure planning sheet that I've linked a couple of times if you scroll down. Uh, that's the sheet that we're going to update. There's two yeah. tabs on it. So there's the one, the first sheet covers the the sort of plot beats of your adventure. The second tab is going to be where you plan out your encounters. That's honestly, you don't even, that's the most of what you need. Like you don't need to do all the the, the formal writing half the time. If you know what the beats of your adventure are and what they're going to fight, if you've got a map, you can just run your content like that. Yep. I do it on Fantasy Grounds a lot when I'm lazy and I don't feel like doing all this stuff. <laughs> I've run it. The, the cool thing is when you really learn the nitty gritty of the game, like you have to do, it's like way less prep. Like I can do it all like off the cuff, like no problem. As long as I've got maps and resources ready to go. Not, not as easy to do these days, like having to do it online with VTTs, but um, like in person, yeah, I don't really need to plan. Somebody asked us earlier if we have a spreadsheet that does the math for us. We do. It's very involved. <laughs> Dave doesn't yeah, well, use it because Dave's like a like a luddite about half of the stuff we do. <laughs> like uh, TJ says, I'm a I'm a tech savvy luddite. Um, it's so weird. Dave's really savvy about a lot of things. We're like, Dave, are you going to use the encounter planning spreadsheet? No. Okay. <laughs> yep, I don't use Trello either. Which much to everybody's chagrin. He's like, <laughs> he's like Sarge, I need this thing. It's on the Trello. <laughs> I won't open that. Yeah, I'll pay for it. But I'm not opening it. Here's a link to throw into the wolves for the folks who are asking. You yeah. can find it on our Patreon. Yep. Uh, yeah, we. I mean, we have development tools because we we involve a lot of other writers. So we have an encounter planning sheet that has other information on it that allows us to co co coordinate six writers plus Dave plus our editors plus the proofing team. And so Dave and I often have to do like complex assessments of the content we're working on. So we need to mm -hmm. process a lot of information at once. When Dave asked me unexpectedly, sorry, here's this information. It's right here. Mm -hmm. oh, too late. I'm not looking at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, you guys asked about XP to milestone. All right. So cool. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll yeah we, we talked about this at the very end of what chapter is it in the DMG that talks about um, it's. Oh, it's near the last. It's section. like the very last paragraph in one of the chapters. I think after poisons. Yeah. Okay. It's like two sixty one in a regular DMG, but it's right before chapter nine at the end of chapter eight. Uh, it talks about milestones in fifth edition. Um, uh, you should see that in offer. Oh, duh. I don't know why I didn't. Sorry, guys. I didn't click the off the thing, but now the offers is up there. So the how to become a prof content professional is up. I forgot to push a button <laughs> so you can click it down now um the uh the milestone is, is pretty simple the way watsy says to do it is um going to be you to get from first to second level it's one session one adventuring day from second to third level it's one adventuring day to get to the fourth level from third level, it's two adventuring days. And then from then on, it's approximately 2.5 to three. And if you take the adventuring day XP and you divide those numbers into the deltas between levels, you will find it roughly comes up to that. One, one, 2.53 ish, all the way down to 20. So the game is, is designed exactly for that in mind. So first level, it's 300 adjusted XP per day per character. How many points to gain level two? 300 points. Uh, same thing, second level is adjusted XP per day per character. To get to level two, you need to have 900 total points and so on. And that's more or less the way they've got it. I really believe that they're just gonna can XP with the uh, next edition that they come out with or make it kind of a, um, it's gonna flip it around. Like milestones are gonna be more important than um, XP. Um, just because- Milestones I think play better, but mm -hmm. we, you use XP as a measuring tool. So what you'd want to do is like, let's say your part, like if you look at Ram of the Frost Maiden, the level eight party needs to make it through the Caves of Hunger to reach level nine. Uh, Cause they're going to be level eight after leaving Oral's Island, depending on what they do there. And so that dungeon has a lot of encounters planned in it, plus one wandering creature who's hunting them down. And they level when they reach the end of the dungeon. 
which just yeah. basically says they're going to, if they survive enough stuff here or they bypass enough stuff here, sure, level them up. And that's kind of how you want to use the math. The in the like, that's how modern design is using the math. We're using it as a, an, a difficulty measuring tool. Yeah. Yeah. Instead so of, er uh, you have to hit things to level. So, um, Jeremiah, Eric asked, um, how do you build encounters without XP? You do it the same way. You just don't, um, you just don't award XP. So when you are, when you're doing all this math, like we said, for an adventuring days, XP, that's one session's worth of points. And as long as you're building each of your sessions like that, where they get that many points, even if you're not actually awarding them, then once every three sessions, they go up a level, right? And that's how you do that. So even if you're not handing out XP, you build it, you use the points in the background to build out your adventures. Because so Jeremiah had said he plays with milestones but build with XP, and that's exactly right. That's basically how we design all of our content, though. Uh, I don't think it's linear. Rick asked if there's a linear relationship between CR and XP in published monsters. I mean, the, the 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 XP value for CR is always the same, right? Like one is 200, a CR2 monster is 450, a CR3 is 700, and so on, so on, all the way up to 155,000 for a CR30 monster. Um, the progressions are based or considered on tiers. So there's a huge jump between fourth, a CR4 monster and a CR5 monster, just like there's a huge jump between a CR 10 and a CR 11. So if you were to graph it, it'd be kind of like eh, boop, eh, boop, eh, each for each of the tiers. And overall, the game kind of like if you were to graph out sort of the mathematics of it, you would see that it goes up pretty steep at first and then starts to level off. And then you start to understand why certain things in the game don't work as well at low levels as they do as high levels. Like we always say, like, don't multi-class in tier one because all you're doing is pushing some of your benefits up in further into the game but it's not a big a deal when you're like 17th level because the you know law of diminishing returns and all this and if you want to get into the economics and the heart of it <laughs> you know it's it's like uh, um yeah it's, ted I'll, yeah i'm totally gonna address that that's funny that you say that because that's exactly the way i think that's what's gonna happen but um the uh yeah, like when you really start understanding some of the, the values of it and how they've kind of built this system, it all comes, it's, it starts to be like the matrix and then everything in the game is really easy to understand. And then you can make monsters on the fly. You can make uh, subclasses and classes on the fly. And as long as you're not messing up the wording, it's it's pretty simple. Uh, Ted asked, Wizards of the Coast could change it from XP to something similar to Unicost. I actually did that for um, our monster book we just put out. I did something similar to make it, try to make it a little bit easier. Because if you look at the numbers, it's kind of silly that they all have two zeros. Anybody who's a scientist here is probably like, why would you, why would you have you know that many points if it's not necessary? <laughs> Aren't geese really just ducks with longer necks? No, geese are from hell. No, <laughs> geese are from geese are from the nine the infinite layers of the abyss, whereas ducks are from the nine layers of Bator. Come on, man, learn your blood war. <laughs> When do we think the next edition will come out? When Watsi stops making money on this one. This is the amount of money that Watsi <laughs> making on edition, and when it gets to here, that's when you'll see sixth edition come. Maybe here. Like, but we're being a little bit facetious, but that's legitimately the answer, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> I gave I gave Goose 30. You can look at it on my Patreon. It's called Oh My God, It's a Goose. How would you recommend adapting a low-level module for higher-level players? It um, depends on what you define as a high level. If it's two to three, very easy. You just add one or two more monsters. If you are changing it, though, to a different tier, like if you're going from tier one to tier two, it becomes significantly different, uh, different because tier two characters are literally uh, probably twice, maybe eight times as powerful as a first-level character um because they have huge damage output way more defensive capabilities um so and then yeah i mean if you're gonna adjust something from like tier one to like way out there in like tier four oh lord uh it's it's you're gonna have to have a lot of considerations put into there typically try to stay within the same tier 
if you can, if you have to adjust. Um, you might get away with a fourth level than the fifth level, but even then, like the difference between fourth and fifth level is night and day. Yeah, I would say like the question would be like if you really want to run a like a low level adventure for your higher level party. Thanks, Robert. There's two. There's two big ways you could do that. First, you run the adventure as is when half the party is not around. Because that's that's kind of fun every now and then. Like everybody's not here this week, and the fighter and the rogue go on a small romp together. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing to do is sort of examine what the adventure's basic uh, build is and rebuild it with the tools we've given you, with similar style creatures. Like if the adventure features brawlers in one room, instead of maybe doing like orcs, you could do like a tier two brawler would be something like like a gladiator maybe. You could maybe get or veterans. Veterans are a good switch up from orcs to them. Mm -hmm. That would be sort, of, but that would, that would change up a lot at that point. Because again, like the kind of things that a level one, like a tier one party, is kind of doing side quests to sort of help people in the neighborhood, whereas tier two parties are like trying to challenge the local baron who's been screwing over people or some dragon who's being an asshole. Yeah, we got um... about five minutes left here, folks. So we're gonna make probably move over to the discord in a few minutes so yeah yeah we'll try to there. answer questions there i'll try to answer some really fast eric asks about uh, he's drawn a map when's he when are you gonna need to have your maps i try to have them by next week for the class uh, if you could and if yeah because we're gonna if, be writing next week yeah if you can i mean if, if you're drawing or whatever you know maybe try to use it on dungeon draft or something like Granted, I'm I'm experienced, so I can make a dungeon draft map in like 30 minutes without too much fail. But um, yeah. Um, and then Michael was asking about making a monster. Depend like if you take away stuff, how will it adjust the experience? Remember, the only two things that are going to change the difficulty of a monster are adjusting its ability to deal damage and its ability to um, um, defend itself. Uh, if you're doing anything that kind of doesn't really fall into those categories, like something weird, like it's teleportation ability, it probably won't change things too dramatically. Um, but yeah, like again, like monster creation is kind of a whole nother beast um, and probably worth like a whole nother, like maybe at least, at least one or two classes on it. I do have a video on YouTube, which you can watch that will have, yeah, that shows me how to make a monster. Um, you should really have your map by next week so that what we're talking about makes sense because you'll be have already thought about your map. You've probably really already thought about where your encounter is going to go. Like we're going to be talking about how to formalize the, the. Like you should have a sense of your adventure at this point. Like we mm -hmm. rolled out what? Like we have to battle a human commoner. Like we have to battle a humanoid commoner in the dungeons. Gonna Conqueror, not commoners. a commoner. <laughs> go, let's go a beat the commoner. We're going to beat him up. Ah, Give us I'm your just money. a gardener. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, you you like we're you're almost there. Like we're we're going to be talking about how to write next week. It'll be more understanding how information is organized in adventures yeah. and why things go where they go. Uh, this uh, is useful for you for yourself when you're running at the table, but it's also important to understand when you're writing commercially or for other people where yeah. you should tell people about stuff. Yep. Got right, two and a half minutes, Dave. Yeah, our clock's ticking. So we're gonna we're gonna move this over to Discord. I'm gonna take a little break, and then we'll be answering some more questions in there. Um, did you posted the Discord link, right, Sarge? Yes, I've been. I'll post it again. Okay. Yeah, y'all know the deal. Um, you can all come into the channel, and we'll try to answer the text-based questions. It's free for anybody. Uh, for the voice to hear me and Sarge, flap our gums. You know, uh, silver to listen, gold to speak. Chat. But uh, yeah. Thank you all so much. We love each and every one of you um, so much. You know, you really help us make this possible. We can do it without you. And we really look forward to seeing all of you next week. Thank you so much for, for signing up again and coming to this class after last week. And thank you for standing through with all this crazy math. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you again. Bye, y'all. Love you.